Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, I'll be glad to use a microphone, but we have such a small group. Uh, if you can hear me okay, it's thumbs up in the back if you can hear me okay. All right. My name is Carter Hillman. I'm the principal at Garner Magnet High School. I really appreciate you folks coming out tonight. Uh, where did this idea come from? We received several calls in the community from parents concerned and just wanted voicing their concerns and voicing their ideas. Uh, Chief uh, Zudema also got some, some phone calls that were, or some emails that were very similar. So we thought, hey, let's get together and see what we can do, if there's something we can do, at least in order to bring group together and have that opportunity for people to come, hear what we're doing, let people in the community know what they can do to help us, um, and then open up for questions. Uh, we're really not looking necessarily to hash this event or hash that event. The events happened, and if you have specific questions about this, we'll be glad to answer those questions. Um, but we're really along the lines of the, the general concerns that we had were about what is Garner doing in order to make sure they're ensuring safety of their students? What is the police department doing in unison with the, with the school in order to make our schools the safest they possibly can be? Um, obviously the tragedy that happened in Parkland and you look at those, those situations that have happened unfortunately seems to be over and over again have, have really sparked that national interest in what are we doing? And, and I really give praise to those students for you know, kind of saying no more. We need to have this conversation. We need to have this conversation at the school, in the communities, within the, um, within the public eye, and within our um, elected officials and what they're going to do in order to support us as well. Uh, obviously, Garner High School is not an isolated community um, that stands on its own and um, is supported only by Garner itself but it's part of a larger institution known as Wake County Public Schools. So when we're looking at that and you have 185 schools in the system, you're looking at, you can't do something for Garner without looking at what you're doing for one way or the other. You don't wanna look at it and say, well, why do they get something that some other school doesn't? Why are they get be, be more safe than another school? At the same time, you don't wanna put it in a negative line like, what's wrong with that school that they're getting something that other schools aren't getting? So this forum tonight is basically just to, to give some more information, to provide you the opportunity to answer questions, um, and hopefully by the end of the evening, um, if you have further questions that we can take offline, I'd be glad to deal with those as well. I'm sure as Chief Zuma was as well. Uh, let me introduce um, everyone up here. My, again, my name's Carter. I'm on the principal of Garner Magnet High School. Uh, to my left is, really doesn't need any, but uh, Mayor Williams. Uh, Mayor Ronnie Williams, who is here uh, supporting us tonight. To his left is Chief Brandon Zudema. Um, to his right is Mike MacGyver. He oversees the SRO grouping in the Garner area, which includes Garner High School and the middle schools as well that have SRO, um, which stands for um, school, resource. school Resource Officer. Thank you. Uh, to his left is Chad Gorman. He is a school resource officer here at Garner right now. And then in his left is Kira Haig. She is our SAP coordinator, and that stands for? Student Assistance Program. Student Assistance Program Counselor. She is part of our counseling staff and deals with students' assistance and dealing more with the social aspect. Um, and, and we wanted to make sure that she was here, too, because obviously part of this context is the social issue that goes along with that. So with that being said, um, I'm going to turn this over to Chief Zudema, see if he has some comments, and then we'll get into uh, this program. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, also, from a, a community standpoint, I want to introduce my boss, the town manager, Rodney Dickerson, who's also here to support us. Um, and I see a lot of faces I recognize in the audience. Uh, a couple of you may have to take the tough questions. Um, I apologize for being a little bit late. Apparently the police in Garner don't manage the traffic very well because I had to come from Raleigh and that didn't go that well. Um, I would echo what um, Mr. Hillman has had to say is that, so we've seen what can only be described as horrific incidents that have occurred around the country. Um, and we've had some minor episodes certainly in this school and in this community because we're no different than any other community. So what we want to try to do is continue an effort that we've been working on for quite some time to communicate with the people that we serve and to try to answer questions, to also make sure that we're trying to educate you, uh, importantly, not just on what we do, but also why we do it. 
Um, and that doesn't mean you necessarily have to agree with it or you necessarily have to think it's the best way, but we want you at least to understand, if you have that question of why, why did they do that, we'll try to explain why we did that. And then if you have other suggestions or ideas, we are always open to that. Again, we tried to bring a pretty diverse group here tonight um, to be able to talk a little bit about, again, the why of what we do as the Garner Police Department, what we do as Garner Magnet High School, and more importantly, I think, what do we do together to make sure that we're safeguarding your students, uh, your family members, this campus, and really this community. Uh, because this school is just one small piece of the larger Garner community. Um, so whether you live in Garner or not is really irrelevant because you're a part of this community by having students in this school or working at this school or visiting this school and any other number of things. So um, I'm going to stop there for a second and I think turn it back over to the school staff to begin a conversation about some of the things that they do proactively. We will follow that up from the police department standpoint uh, and then we will certainly get into some question and answer as well. So when we are, are thinking about obviously the, the numerous things that go into a school community, um, one of those ends up, a large one ends up being school safety. And how are we being proactive in our establishing uh, policy and protocol uh, for the, in case of the event? What are the things that we are putting in place uh, in order to, to create greater safety on campus? At the same time, what are we doing in case something comes to this, that we're being prepared for that instead of saying, we have someone on campus like this, what do we do? Uh, we need to make sure that we're prepared for those events. Uh, first of all, all Wake County schools have a crisis plan. Now that crisis plan comes with setting up for the smallest event to the largest event. So the student who um, passes out in the hallway because they, they didn't eat that morning and they feel lightheaded, that's part of the security plan all the way up to that there's a potential gun on campus or is a gunman on campus along those lines. And we have to look at the entire facet of those and how we're dealing with that plan. Obviously, we deal with the student illness much more often. So that, that comes in with what are we doing with what are our teachers doing? Who are they communicating with? How are they responding given the different area and the size of the school? Um, obviously, an event can happen on, in the D building in the academic wing, and those in the gymnasium may not even know what's going on at that point. So how are we communicating those things, and how are each of those groups interacting and reacting within that plan? So within that crisis plan, you have sub-leaders who are our teachers and our staff members in different areas of the building that are to respond kind of as, as first responders, first communicators, should an event occur. Uh, within that plan, we also end up having code red drills. Now, a code red drill is basically the idea that there is a threat on campus and we need to lock down the building. We do this a couple times a year in order to make sure that we're being prepared. We have done this to the point where I am the only person on campus that knows when that drill is going to occur. I'm not even communicating that with my assistant principals. Um, and I'm only told the day, I'm not told the time and when that will happen. Uh, the individuals who come in is supported by the, the police, the, the local police officers, and, and, and supporting communities that are helping them out because they'll come in with a group of 15 or 20 individuals. We will go down in lockdown and what they do is start assessing where we are. Um, are, we, are we going through the practices correctly? After that is done with, we return the students back to a regular schedule. We are back on normal schedule, and then we debrief. We start talking about, okay, in this room, we heard some students talking, but we could not get into the room. The room was locked. This room, the door was unlocked. And since when we go through those processes that we are trying to continually improve where we are and with what we are doing. In um, addition to that, we have a threat, threat assessment that we go through in the crisis plan. Um, after the officers leave, uh, Wake County security comes in and we go through case scenarios. This happens or this happens or this happens, how are you to respond to get us thinking about different events that can occur. Um, we also have a communication plan and how we are supposed to move through the system. Now obviously one of our communications is with the police department, the other communication ends up being through Wake County. Um, 
And, and oftentimes when we're communicating through Wake County, they are kind of starting to say, listen, we need you to do this, then we need you to do that. Um, and, and they are kind of taking over that communication and how that communication is going to go out. Same thing with the police department from their side. Um, we do have the role of obviously Wake County Public School System security. Uh, our, our security officer is Dana Drisco. If we call him and say we have an issue on campus, he comes to this campus. Now he has a wider area than just Garner, but Garner is part of his area. Um, and if he is not in at that time, we have another officer that we are told to contact and they will come in. Um, finally, with, with all of our plans, whether they're fire drills or whether this week we have our severe weather drill coming up, uh, the drills that are intended in order to have students and staff understand the roles that they need to play and how they need to respond accordingly in order to make sure that we are safe within those systems. Um, within our school, we have approximately uh, 17, 18 different access points as far as, uh, as main doors going into the building with basically the panic lock uh, that opens from the inside going out. Uh, we continually monitor those, but with 2,800 students on campus, a student going out, a student coming in, um, and someone else waiting along those lines and, hey, can you let me in? That's continual training to make them aware. Now, we do not want to create a state of, of continued fear of students coming to campus and their response is out of fear. To me, uh, a student in fear uh, trying to learn is no different than a student who is hungry, who is trying to learn. Uh, what we're trying to do is create a state of vigilance, is that there is a responsibility within your community, and this being a community itself, that you have a role to play, and each of us has a role to play. That if we see that someone wants to go through, no, you have to go through the main entrance is where you're supposed to go through, not let me in. Um, all of our doors are locked throughout the school day with the exception of the morning hours because you have so many students coming into the building. Uh, you have the buses coming in from this way. You have students coming in from the other way. So you have these access points, but as soon as that, is, that transportation for the morning is over with, all, the, all those ex exterior doors are locked with the exception of the front door. That does not, again, stop a student who someone else is knocking on a door and saying, hey, I'll just let you in and not thinking about it. And that takes retraining. And what I've noticed from, from the events of recently, our students are much more cognizant of what they are doing and much more willing to hear that conversation from adults saying, you can't be doing that. All of our safety is. When our students, we're not just look, talking about our students, but we're talking about our staff. Um, it's not just students who are being killed in these, these situations. So that we all need to make sure that we're cognizant within that larger approach. Things you want to add from the counselor standpoint. Um, so like Mr. Holman said, we do do threat assessments. The counseling team is part of all drills that happen. Um, we also communicate and keep an open communication with our administrative team for anything that happens. So when students have been in fear, they do, um, counselors are on alert when situations are going on or when something has happened. Um, even if one person is in the building, we, we make sure that we notify all the counselors that are in the building um, what's going on so that we're all aware and that so that we can be responsive to your students um, If students are scared or if there's something going on We want to meet with them individually um, and communicate with you all you all are our greatest source parents in the community You all are our greatest source and our greatest connection to the students that we serve um, Many times students will tell you things that they don't always share with the school So we do ask that you guys communicate things that you are concerned about with us um, Especially when it comes to the students and the school safety um, we do do um, signs of suicide programs to look, for, to look for possible signs or symptoms of suicide um, and to educate students on what those signs or symptoms look like so that they can be on alert as well. And it's all about educating students so that they know what to look for in different things and different scenarios. So we do signs of suicide. We also have a threat assessment that we do in partnership with the administrative team if we feel like a student may be a potential threat um, to themselves or to others. Um, so we work together with administrators to do that threat assessment um, as well as any suicide screenings or anything that may cause us to reach out to you all or, or concern of the school safety. Um, what else? 
I don't think so. The only thing I, I would add is that um, our public safety, one of our public safety teachers came forward um, and pointed out, a, <coughs> excuse me, a FEMA training mm -hmm. in dealing with school safety. Uh, he, he approached me last week about this. Uh, it was too late to incorporate into our training on Friday because we already had that scheduled. But we have planned to incorporate that in for all staff um, on the 19th. We have department meetings on that day. So instead of doing department meetings, we're going to come in here and go through that training process. Just because our teachers want to know as well. You know, what do I do with this? And what do I do with that? And it's the idea of going through these scenarios so they're thinking through these ideas prior to anything, heaven forbid, should it happen. We also have all adults on campus have taken the trusted adult pledge which is a Save Something pledge that came out of, um, in response to Sandy Hook, that was brought to us by our Save Sad Club, our Students Against Violence Everywhere. Um, they, we took that pledge during Anti-Bullying Week. We encourage all staff to take the pledge. And what it says is all staff members throughout the school and all their offices or outside of every classroom have a sign posted that says, I am a trusted adult, because we want students to be able to identify who <coughs> trusted adults are, what is a trusted adult and the trusted adults are all over the school. Um, we're all here to help them if they feel like there is something they see that is a warning sign, they see a signal, if they see a threat of any source, whether it's on social media or in an email, we have those signs throughout the school in everyone's classroom and offices so that students know, even if they're not familiar with that particular staff member, they can identify that that staff member is a trusted adult and they can come to them if they feel like something is going on or if they feel like they are in danger. Okay. Chief Zudeman is going to now re, uh, discuss from the, the police standpoint their, their work with us. Thank you. So I think the most evident thing that we do is the school resource officer program. So normally, uh, in most normal years, we have two uh, school resource officers. Those are uniformed police officers that are specially given additional training. Again, Officer Gorman is one of the two uh, that are assigned to the high school because of the size. Because if you think about it, um, all told, there's probably 26, 2,700 enrolled between here and the ninth grade campus. I mean, that's bigger than some small communities to have a police department. Um, so this really is its own community. And so this year is, I, I think I can say, a, a uniquely challenging year or two years because of the split campus as well. So 10th through 10th graders, for the most part, are on this campus, while the 9th graders are at the 9th grade center, which is the old movie theater immediately adjacent to the original Garner Magnet High School campus. So what we have this year is one SRO that is full-time assigned to this building, and then the second SRO that is normally full-time assigned to the 9th grade center. Um, so when this campus returns to Spring Drive next year, uh, we'll again have two full-time police officers on that campus. Uh, this campus will then open as South Garner, and we anticipate uh, having a police officer here as well. And again, a lot of that is through a collaborative partnership with the Wake County Public School System. Um, it is also a significant commitment on the part of the mayor and council, um, because although the school system is authorized to fund a portion of that based on a state rate, a lot of that comes from the council. Um, committing to having resource officers in our schools, which we think is incredibly important. Uh, as of today, we have four police officers that are assigned full-time uh, to the schools, two at the high school, again, split this year, one at East Garner Magnet Middle and one at um, North Garner Middle School. And then with the school, the high school opening in the fall, we eventually anticipate probably having two there. And then if the school system continues with the plan for Bryan Road Middle, that would put us at seven full-time school resource officers or approximately 10% of our sworn staff being committed to the schools, for school safety, because there's, I can't imagine anything we could say that would be more important than school safety. So again, those, those folks are here for several reasons. First, and I think primarily, is that they're here to be able to interact with primarily students, but also faculty and staff in a non-confrontational setting. Um, because far too often we have young men and women that grow up and the only interaction they have with the police is when something went wrong. Um, because folks don't call 911 to invite the police over for a barbecue, they call 911 when things have gone wrong. So we are working proactively to try to get away from that. Um, part of that is to um, have SROs in the high schools, part of that is through SROs in the middle school, we also have our PAL program. Um, so we're trying to do a lot of things to positively interact with youth, again, in a non-confrontational setting to let them see that police officers are just people that have a unique job and responsibility in the community. Um, the SROs are also on campus to educate. They're here to educate students um, as to both their rights and their responsibilities. 
Um, students are usually very good at, at wanting to have the rights, maybe not always quite as good at taking on the responsibility. So we want to share both of those. And then they're also here to provide some level of security and certainly be a deterrent to those that might want to do wrong on the campus. Um, there's a zillion other things they do as well, but I think that's probably the big three um, that we talk about. But again, as you can imagine, that's one uniformed officer on this campus. And if you've not walked around this campus, I encourage you to do so. It is large. Um, and the new campus back at Garner Magnet will be, again, even probably larger than it was to some extent. So that's one person, um, two people in some cases that we can have on campus trying to do what we can to help with security. Uh, again, one of the other things that the SROs do and that we do in other circumstances is staff training. Um, so a lot is what they do on their own through FEMA training and through other things, but we also meet with the staff, uh, sometimes in large groups, sometimes in small groups, trying to educate them as to what do you do if, um, and trying to build some of that muscle memory so that if something bad happens, they're prepared to know what to do. And of course, they know what to do to some extent through a crisis plan, through signage in the building, and through continued training, but we try to support that as well. Uh, we of course actively investigate all threats. Um, so we fortunately do not deal a lot with that, but we take threats like that very seriously. Uh, many of you will remember, uh, I think it was in August of last year, uh, that we had a situation where a student had gone onto social media and had threatened to use a firearm the next day at the school. Um, we found out about that, uh, I know my phone started blowing up, I think about 7.30, 8 o'clock, at the same time that my daughter, who's a senior here, um, I could hear her clamoring down the stairs going, Dad, 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 have you seen this? at the same time that my phone started ringing because people were seeing it on social media. Um, so that was 7.30, 8 o'clock. We immediately threw resources at that. Um, I think we probably had 10 or 12 officers, detectives, and supervisors working on that. And uh, with the support of the school system and school security, um, that gentleman was identified, located, and in custody, um, I think by about 12 o'clock that night, 12.30 that morning. Um, so you know, we try to be as proactive as we can. Um, you know, folks can argue, are you overreacting? They're just kids, they're just talking. I don't think in today's day and age we can overreact anymore. I don't think there is such a thing. Um, but again, keep in mind that we don't necessarily <coughs> prosecute every student that does something that is wrong in the sense of the law. Um, Officer Gorman deals with things all the time that technically constitute a violation of the law, but we don't arrest <coughs> or prosecute or uh, take every child to juvenile domestic relations court if they commit what would otherwise be a violation of the law outside the school. We try to balance that with the need for security in the school, but also understanding that they are kids and that they're around 2,500 of their closest friends on a regular basis, and sometimes they just do knuckleheaded kind of things. However, making a threat to come to school the next day and shoot people is, in my opinion, not a knuckleheaded thing. It's a crime. Um, and that can't be tolerated. So um, we definitely have far more referrals uh, than we do arrests. Uh, we arrest very few students every year, but we do interact with students. Uh, we do help the school system and the court system to hold students uh, accountable through teen court and other alternatives to actually being put into the criminal justice system. Uh, and of course, we'll see even more of that as North Carolina is now becoming the 50th state um, to raise the age to where our 16 and 17 year olds as of December of 2019 uh, will be treated as juveniles rather than adults in almost all cases. So we tried to do a lot with that. Uh, may, you may have heard that the North Carolina legislature has convened a school safety committee. Um, so that is in response to what happened in Parkland, Florida, uh, and they've got a number of legislators on that. I can tell you that I've spoken to several of them uh, to make sure that law enforcement get involved in that committee. Uh, great respect for the legislators. They do a lot of things. That's why I was late tonight was coming from there. Um, but they're also respectfully not police officers. So they need to make sure that they're involving the professionals that handle that sort of thing. And I also suggested to them we need to involve school officials because school officials are certainly a piece of that puzzle as we look for ways to harden the target in the context of our schools and find ways to keep our students safe and keep our community safe. So we are certainly working with the legislature on a regular basis. The other piece um, that is particularly unique for this campus is it's isolated. Um, and it's also a wide open, as you, I think you heard 18 
different entrances to the building. Um, you know, there's a number of rows, a number of fields, a number of ways to get out here. Um, and it doesn't have the natural surveillance that the Garner Magnet Campus has. The Garner Magnet Campus has residents around it, it has businesses around it, it has a shopping center around it. Um, so we get call upon call upon call of students that have wandered away from there or things that seem out of place. And out here, you just don't have some of that natural surveillance that you have sometimes at the other <coughs> campus. But we're aware of that. Um, the staff is certainly aware of that. We try to make sure that we are um, aware and making sure that we're present, particularly beginning of the day, end of the day, as a deterrent that folks might want to do something wrong. The last thing I'll share with you is that if heaven forbid something happens on this campus, um, what you're going to see is a flood of public safety and school officials. Um, because the school is going to notify us, at the same time they're notifying Wake County Security. So Wake County Security is going to flood this with as many resources as they have available. And then you're immediately going to see as many of the following as we can put out here. And that's going to include the Garner Police Department. Um, because again, we're, we're kind of on an island here, although you're technically standing in the town of Garner. Um, as soon as you walk off the campus back to the highway, you're back in the county for a while. We can have a whole different conversation about the ETJ and how that works, but we're on an island out here, but you're in Garner at this very moment, so the school is our responsibility. So you'll see Garner <coughs> Police. You'll see the Wake County Sheriff's Office. You will certainly see the North Carolina Highway Patrol. Um, wouldn't be unreasonable to see Raleigh PD come out here and help us. And then you're certainly going to see Wake EMS if we need them, Garner Fire if we need them, and a lot of other people um, that will flood the resources out here to respond to something that would happen. Um, so that is not necessarily the greatest assurance because that's reactive rather than proactive, but that's one thing that we train for and prepare for. So the other thing we want to do um, is help you help us be proactive. So what we want to do is go over just a couple of different ideas. Um, <coughs> Lieutenant McKeever and Officer Gorman are going to cover a couple things from the police department standpoint. And then I believe uh, Mr. Hillman and Tag are going to cover a couple things from the school side. And then we'll certainly move into questions. Um, but again, know that you are the best tool we have to try to prevent anything that might happen on this campus and involving our students. Um, because the administrators here, you have a staff of five or six between six. the two campuses, so six people. Um, it, and so I have a real appreciation for the SRO program because it's one of the first things I did in my former life was as an SRO. And what you quickly realize is that, so you've got 26, 2,700 students here and you've got a lot of teachers, but they have responsibilities. Their, their job is to teach primarily. Um, so you're, you're having all those kids come out here with two SROs and six adults that, by the way, also have other things to do besides just monitor the campus and monitor behavior. So we're already sort of at a deficit in that regard, so I think we do the best we can to be proactive with that. But you know your students, and your students know their friends, and that's where the help is going to come from. Um, so what we want to do is give you just a couple of things to think about. These are both very simple and very straightforward, um, but we want to kind of talk through those and then let the school share some of that as well. Mayor? Through. I attended Garner Schools. I graduated Garner Schools. I would never have thought we would be here discussing what we're discussing tonight. But y'all know, as I know, it's a changing world, and we have to respond to change, unfortunately. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening. Good evening. How many of you are children on a smartphone? Raise your hand. How many of you paid the bill for that smartphone? Don't be afraid to look at it. Don't be afraid to go through it. Don't be afraid to monitor your child's actions and behavior. I've learned over the years, I've got a child at this school as well. I've got two grown children. And we don't know everything, and we never will. Now, that's the fact of life. So one of the things I really encourage you to do is monitor their cell phone activity. There's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of apps out there that they're able to communicate with each other on, and it disappears, I mean, quick. So, so they say it disappears. There's always a way to get that information back if you need it bad enough. So the, the reason I bring that up is we've kind of jumped on a campaign that is catching fire across the nation. It's, if you see something, say something. Don't keep it to yourself. If there's something that makes the hair on the back of your neck rise or, or the hair on your arms, stand straight up. It's, 
you're, it's for a reason. It's happening for a reason. And we'll investigate it. Look into it. If it's something that just doesn't feel right, give us a call. That's what we're here for. That's what everybody's here for, is to make sure we have a safe campus. I wasn't loud enough. So, uh, if you see something, say something. We, we, we have various uh, methods that you can contact us through social media, through uh, calling our office. Through, I, I get probably 20, 25 texts just like that when we start having an issue here because everybody knows where I work and, and they have children on campus as well. We also, uh, during lockdown drills, you heard uh, the Principal Hillman talk about, we go through and at the end of the discussion, what we're talking about, we could see students in a room where they're hiding, or we could hear them, doors locked or not. That's for their safety. Stress to your, your child that when we do these drills, it's important, you never ever know if it's going to happen here. We pray to God that it doesn't, but it's a possibility. So that needs to be taken seriously. We, uh, there's also some other concepts besides just hiding. There's also what, what you'll hear of run, hide, or flight, or fight. We, we hide first for the most part in, in the classroom, lock the doors, be very quiet. If you have an opportunity to run, to get away from it, and this can be applied to if you're in your business and you have an active shooter situation. Run away from the fire. If you hear it, run away from it. And you also have the opportunity to fight for your life if it comes down to that. Teach your children, if it comes to that, fight for your life. I've touched on uh, monitoring their social media you have various instances where children are getting bullied on social media pretty constant and that affects their lives in a negative way and if you look back at the other shootings and school incidences that's happened over the years there's some bullying being reported and finally the biggest challenge that we have is when your child receives a school threat on Snapchat and they forward it and don't tell anyone. Then their friends forward it. Then their friends forward it. That makes our job that much more difficult to find the original threat. Have them feel comfortable, come talk to you. Tell them it's okay to come talk to you. They don't have to be the one to report it, you can. Anything to add? Yeah, the, the few things that I kind of wanted to add to that and just expand upon on a, a few different things was the social media thing. Uh, the kids are light years ahead of, of any of us, even, you know, our, our youngest officers still can't keep up with a lot of times with the, what the high school kids are doing. Um, like Lieutenant McKeever hit on, sit down with your kids, look at their phones. They've got all the apps on their phones make them take the time to sit down with you and show you what these apps are, what they do. Uh, the, the two big ones that I'm seeing pretty much every day from the school that we're having issues with are Instagram. There's a direct message program through that basically where they can message each other even if they don't have the other person's contact information. And then obviously the, the hot button one is, is Snapchat. That's where we've been getting a lot of the threats dispersed through and that stuff goes like wildfire. So sit down with your kids, get them to explain to you what these social media accounts are, what they do, what they're capable of. And if the kids can't show you what they are or why they have them or, or what they're good for, maybe you need to have the conversation with your kid that they shouldn't have that app on their phone. Um, the, the other thing that Lieutenant McKeever kind of talked on a little bit was run, hide, and fight. Um, what I've seen is a lot of people are looking at us wanting to find out exactly what they should do for this one specific incident. It's something that you guys need to sit down with and, and talk to your kids about and have a plan in place for if something like this does happen, this is what I expect you to do. You know, obviously I would, I would recommend trying 
stick with what the school's telling them to do, that if it's at all possible, hide and avoid the situation. But if you feel like the best situation for, or the best solution for your child is to, to run away from it, that's a conversation that you need to have ultimately. You're the parent, so we're, we're gonna look at what you think is best as well. But that's something that the kids need to understand and have guidance from at home. It's a conversation that needs to happen beforehand. And then another thing while we're on that topic, Mr. Hillman brought up all the different drills that we do. Um, you know, there's, there's fire drills, there's severe weather drills, there's code red drills, all that. There's a situation that, that bothered me a little bit last week. I was here later for an off-duty event and the fire alarm started going off and it was about 4.30, 4.45. And so I came out and started walking through the school to, uh, to help push kids out of the school. And I had probably 30 kids sitting in the cafeteria looking at me while the fire alarm is going off. There, it's got an audible thing that tells you to exit the school, all that, and they're just sitting in the cafeteria hanging out. And so, you know, it's something that maybe you might want to talk to your kids about. Yes, we do these drills. The downside to that sometimes can be that they're a little bit desensitized to some of this stuff, and that when you have an actual incident like that going on, they think it's just a drill. I mean, fortunately, it wasn't actually a fire. I think somebody damaged a fire alarm and it caused the thing to go off. But it's 4.30. This isn't a, this isn't a drill. You know, the, the school's not here seeing if you know what to do for a fire alarm. So you need to sit down and talk to the kids about the, the severity of some of this stuff, if, if anything never does happen, and that no matter what they have, they need to take it seriously. So that would be my piece. Before I move forward, uh, Ms. Gill, Rosa Gill, thank you very much. Where are you? There you are. Thank you very much for attending tonight. I appreciate that. Um, you're going to hear some redundancies there. Uh, and I have to talk to ninth grade parents when we have our open houses in ninth grade. And the first thing I do is I pull it out, the cell phone, and say, how many of your kids have one of these? How many of you had one of these when that, that you were that age? Most of them are like, I didn't have one but they sure do and most of them don't own it themselves most of them aren't paying the bills on it, it it's your phone uh, and and it's a privilege to have that phone they may not see it that way they see it as lifeline but it, it's your phone uh, so, so own that phone um, and and don't be afraid of it uh, I've, I've got three at home uh, and at 10 o'clock every night they have to turn their phones in into our room and we charge them and we know their passwords, and they know that any time we are going to look at them. Uh, they are not happy about that, um, and there are times they are definitely not happy to be turning it in at 10 o'clock at night, but that's the rules of the house. When, when they buy their own phone and, and can do a contract, then, then we can renegotiate that. None of them are at that point that want to do that. Uh, they like mom and dad paying for it. Um, but we had to be educated. We had to talk to our, 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 our oldest son, who kind of asked for things first. Uh, you know, what is Snapchat? Show us what it does. Um, and, and why are you using it? Uh, why are you using Instagram? And to be honest, our, our oldest did not have Snapchat until he was a sophomore, uh, because he couldn't give us good enough reason why, why he needed it. Well, if you have Instagram, why do you have Snapchat? Well, because I have to have both. It's like, well, if you can give me a better reason, then we'll consider it. Um, so we have to be very cognizant of it, because this is the way that our, our kids are communicating. Um, if you see them at home, I mean, the, the big wave right now is Fortnite. Uh, you know, when, when I was young, my friends and I get together and play Risk, or, or play something, and co all come together for three or four hours and play it. Now they all have to go to their own locations, and they get on. So they're still playing together, but all separate because that's how that game works. Um, but this is how they communicate. Uh, and you don't see them necessarily on the phone talking. It's, it's all through text. And, and with Instagram and particularly Snapchat, all you need to do is, is take, a, take an image and pass it on to the next person. Now, the problem is it ends up being an overlay. So if I get a message, so a few, few weeks ago when we got this rogue message that came in for Rocky Mount, 
it came into one of our students in the Garner area. Uh, and that's why it seemed like it was a Garner issue. But instead of communicating with us or the police, back out to about 11 or 12 individuals. Well, now his footprint's on that. And those individuals took a screenshot and snapped it out again. Now there's, the, there's 11 more footprints. And what the police have to do is piggyback backward to see because that name is showing up and it looks like they're the one that sent the message. They are because they re-snapped it, but they aren't the original uh, creator of that message. So you kind of have to start pulling those layers off, which takes time. If that student had told us and notified us when he originally got that text or got that snap, we probably would have had a response by within a matter of an hour or two. Instead of trying to find out, I think we were working on that, the, the police department was working on that until probably about, was it about 7.30, 8 o'clock at night when you got me a phone call. Uh, and, and it could have been done with by 5 o'clock. And that's where the part that becomes imperative. Try, we try to tell our students, if you know something in school, let us know. It doesn't have to be me, it doesn't have to be Kira, but there needs to be some adult that you feel that you trust. Somewhere between a teacher, some adult in the building. But that also has to be communicated at home. Uh, that, and I tell my, tell my children, I said, I'm not here to be your friends, but I am here to be your protector. And if you have something that you're afraid of, you need to let us know. And if, if, if you want to be able to communicate that, or you want me to communicate, I will communicate that. Uh, but it, it's difficult for us to respond to something that we don't know about. Um, and, and I get that that's frustrating from a parent standpoint, saying, well, you've got all these, these adults and all these kids and no one's saying anything, but there is still kind of that code of, well, I'm not going to say something. Um, and we're dealing with our, all of our safety in these situations. So have those conversations with your kids. Um, I think about what they're talking about as far as in case an event should happen. And you know, we talk to our, our kids and have action plans as far as a fire in our own house and what we're going to do and how you're going to respond and where you're going to go. And unfortunately, in this day and age, and I completely agree with Mayor Williams here, I hate having this conversation. When I got into education 25 years ago, this is not a conversation that I expected to ever have. But it's a, it's a conversation that needs to be had. And we need to be realistic about and having those conversations with our students so they can be vigilant themselves. And, th and they are empowered and know what their, what their plan is. Not talking about is not going to make this go away. And that's part of the reason we're having this event tonight. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna make sure I'm covering. Yeah, what were you gonna say? That, then I'll follow up with that. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, we do do our signs of suicide program. I'll stand behind here so you guys can hear me. Uh, we do do our signs of suicide program. That program is given to our ninth graders and our seniors. Um, so we don't go into the classroom to go we don't go into the classroom for signs of suicide with our 10th and 11th graders, but our counselors do go into the classrooms for other reasons and we do interact with the students um, and share the same information with them. What the program looks like is there's a video that goes with the program and then we talk to students about the possible signs or symptoms of depression, um, like isolation, changes in mood, changes in habits, but we also educate them so that they can come home and educate you all and you guys can have that conversation with them um, about mental health or about bullying. We've brought, somebody brought up bullying earlier, um, but just talking to your students, making an open, keeping an open and safe dialogue for your students to come to you and kind of share what may be going on with them, um, whether it's with them or their friends. I know sometimes students may come home and you guys, you know, as busy parents and working, you're working all day and then they come home and they want to talk about their friend and they're talking about this and talking about that. We're trying to keep up with what is going on. And sometimes we may say, you know, I'm worried about you and not your friends. Um, but for them, sometimes that is their world. And sometimes in those conversations, they could, you could hear something that's going on with the friend um, just by listening to your student that could cause you some concern. And we want you to share that information with us. Um, even if you want to call one of the counselors or any of the admin about your, your students or your students' friends to share that information as open and as transparent as we can be with each other, um, as you all are with your students and talking to them about what, is, what does depression look like or what are possible signs or symptoms of this? What does it mean to be bullied? How does bullying look? What does harassment look like? Those things, 
What does it mean to feel unsafe? How does safety look for you? Um, talking to them about those things and asking them those questions. Do you feel safe at school? Do you feel safe in your classroom? How is your friend? How are you today? Having those conversations with them and really listening and providing that safe environment um, so that they can come to you guys and express it. And then you all can share that information back with us if there is something that we need to be concerned about. And I think that in, in being a community like Garner, you're not only a parent to yourself, but you're a parent to every, every child who walks through your door who, the fr who are friends of your kids. And you're having probably not as significant conversations, but you're asking along those lines and how they're doing. Because they may not have that adult at home that can have that conversation with, and they may feel more comfortable talking to you about it. Um, and, and, and that's the nature of being a community, is that I'm looking out for my child, but I'm looking out for my child's friends as well, and those people who walk through my door. And if um, I'm willing to give them food, then they're willing to get to listen to me a little bit too. Uh, it's, it's the give and take, and some of them laugh about it, and some of them are like, oh yeah, it's Mr. Hillman talking again. Um, and then, then when I'll just leave and let my wife take care of it, and, and she's worse than I am. They don't realize that until she starts talking. Um, but it's, it's, it's a community group, and that's the part that I love so much about Garner. It is a community, and we are concerned about not just our students, but our students' friends and the welfare of the schools as a whole. Now, of course, we're concerned about our primary charges of our own students and what's going on with them. But obviously, if you're keeping our kids safe, we're keeping our, our, friends, our, our children's friends safe, then we're much larger circle in that representation. So I, w I would say, you know, when you're having those conversations, um, you know, what is your response in those conversations if something should come up? Communicate with us. Let us know along those lines, you know, what's going on and what's happening so that we can investigate it. Uh, since, since Parkland, uh, I'd say that we've investigated about four or five different situations. None of them have had merit. It was based on, I had this rumor, we think this is the case, can you look this, look this up? And we have not found anything, but we have pursued that along those lines. It's our obligation um, to make sure that we, with the information that we get, and some information is much more detail-oriented than others. So it takes a little bit longer to investigate something that, that lacks the details, but we will investigate it to the fullest of our ability and incorporate the police when, when we need to along those lines. Did you have anything else you wanted to add with that? Yeah, that's yeah. good. Yeah. So I want to just kind of hit two points, and then we're going to open it up, and we'll try to answer some questions. The first one would be to once again emphasize that we are in this together. Um, the police cannot solve this problem. The schools cannot solve this problem alone. We are in this together. So please, if you're a student and you see something that seems out of place or you're just not sure, please tell a responsible adult, please tell a trusted adult that you see something that seems out of place. Because the worst thing that happens is a school official or perhaps a police officer looks into it, finds out nothing's wrong and no harm, no foul, and we move on. The worst thing that happens is something bad happens that perhaps could have been prevented. Um, and the same thing goes for the adults, is encourage your students. And the same for you. It's just like in your neighborhood. When, yet, when that hair goes up on the back of your neck and something seems out of place in your neighborhood, it's probably because it is. And you're the ones that know that better than anyone. And so the same goes for your students in this school. This is their school. They're going to know when things are out of place. They're going to know when someone is acting out of place. If you look at what happened in Florida, how many people came forward and said, man, that guy was strange, or he did this, or he did that, and now we're finding out he's been reported to other people as a potential threat, and that information was there. And I don't mean that to be critical of the people that had the information, but it was there. So what I encourage you to not be is the person that had that information before something happens. Um, because the other thing you haven't heard me say tonight, you haven't heard Mr. Hillman say tonight, is here's our plan to 100% make sure nothing happens at this school. Because we're not going to lie to you. We don't have the ability to do that. What we have the ability to do is to educate you, to work collaboratively and to do things to make it more difficult for that to happen and to hopefully prevent something from happening. But we also need to be prepared 
as to how to respond, because unfortunately in today's day and age, we can't make you that promise. I wish we could, but we can't make you that promise. So again, as, as you, um, once we've had some Q&A and had a chance to talk, as you go away from here tonight, what I hope you'll take away is please help us, help be a part of this community, help be a part of the solution to how do we prevent these type of incidents, and that means see something, say something. If it seems out of place, share it, report it. And again, particularly for your students, if they're seeing things on Instagram and Snapchat and everything else, the answer is not to resend it out to as many people as they possibly can. The answer is to tell a responsible adult who will then take the appropriate action to hopefully keep that from getting anywhere else. And if it is a legitimate threat, allow us to address it in a timely manner. So with that, I think we're all prepared to uh, answer questions. And uh, we have a microphone if you need it, but yes, sir. We all know this is not the first gun in this school, and it's not going to be the last gun in this school. Uh, Ms. Gill is sitting here as a board member. I was a student in the 80s when she was a teacher at Enloe. She'll tell you, there was guns then in Enloe. She knows them. I know them. I know she saw them. I saw them. They were there. The difference we have today is the SRO in this school, what we didn't have back then. I'd like to hear about the relationship that the SRO has with the administration in that there's only 16 crimes that has to be reported to the police department. There's only 16 cases where you have to give the SRO information. Are you giving the SRO information outside of those 16 crimes or just those 16 crimes? <laughs> uh, so I guess that one's directed to me. Um, I work kind of hand in hand with the administration throughout the day to day on a lot more than those 16 things that you're you're referencing. Uh, I, I kind of I'm not part of the the school administration, but I, I kind of assimilate with the school. Uh, we have what we lovingly refer to as the the timeout room over here, where there's usually at least one assistant principal in there that deals with all of the the little issues that come out through throughout the day, and on most times of the day you can usually find me in and around that area assisting them so uh, yes there are certain things that they are required to report to us but throughout the day there's there's a whole lot more that I'm aware of that's going on does that kind of answer your if you are included in months, why did it take four days for the police department to get notified in this last sentence I, I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't investigate that incident. That was well, investigated you. by the, the SRO on the ninth grade center, and I can't answer that specifically. Uh, I, I understand that there was also a, a delay in anything even being reported to the school. And I think that there will so, handle that. And I think Mr. Hillman come up and help me out here for a second. So the incident in question is that uh, about three weeks ago, um, there was a report of a firearm on the campus. No, ma'am, this was a firearm. This was a handgun. Um, and that, that was reported to a school official. It was subsequently reported to the police department. Um, and then there was a collaborative effort between the police and the school system um, to identify the student involved, to locate the firearm, to get a confession as to the possession, and to deal with that. that and uh, Mr. Hillman actually sent a, a robocall out. Correct. Correct. That's correct. Uh, so it was very vague earlier this week. That's what we got. It, it, it was. Uh, again, when you're, when you're um, asked to respond to those, if you look at any of the Wake County, we have to go through Wake County channels and what, what we are asked to respond and how we are to respond. Uh, the weapon was on campus on Monday. Uh, we received a rumor that was a vague rumor about a Snapchat that had a picture of a student with a weapon, but no one came forth with who the student was. It was a student with a weapon at some time. It wasn't that there was a student on campus, here is a student with a weapon. What are you going to do about it? So we have to investigate that first to determine the legitimacy of with what was going on. So the delay in that was that trying to find out the legitimacy of is it a student with a weapon on campus at this given time or just a 
picture of a student with a weapon at some time at, in some location. Within that specific, when we were looking for the, that, we actually did bring that student in as far as about five or six students who we interviewed uh, during that time. So that student was brought in on that day but did not have the weapon in his possession at that time when we searched him. On the next day, the student was not in school. That was at the point when we realized this student we had another student come forward and confirm on Tuesday afternoon after school, a student confirmed after the parent brought the student back to school to say this is what went on, that we could start the investigation and bring the police department in, which was on Wednesday morning. And your message said Thursday. Thank you, Carl. I, I think it's required by law to report it. Is it not? But my question is, if you do that, who's going to send this kid to school on Tuesday? I think that's the decision of the parents. Right, but I think he's created a whole different sense of power. I disagree. My question, let me ask you how to use that mic. Do you use that mic? Was the police department included on Tuesday night? On Tuesday evening, when we were trying to find and find out the information, the information did not go to police until on Wednesday morning when the SRO arrived on so campus. When you know, so when you were aware that there was a weapon on campus and a crime had been committed, as you were required to report by no, law no. to the school, to the police department, it didn't get done for at least 12 hours. You saw something, but you didn't say something. He's, he's so, got SRO in his if, school. If, if I you believe that's why the SRO is in that school. Am I not correct? And I'm understanding that. On Tuesday, when we received this information from a student, we still needed to corroborate that. Any student can give out any information, and we still needed well, why to. Why not get the police department involved? And that's what we did Wednesday morning. Why didn't you do it Tuesday night? That's his job. And I'm it not disagreeing with. Okay, sir. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Compl I'm agreeing with you. Let me finish. Uh, His job becomes very different from your job. That's correct. Your job, if they lie to you, you can't do a whole lot about it. They lie to him. It's a matter of a criminal offense, whether they're 14 or whether they're 21. Correct. Correct. He's got a lot more weight in solving this issue than you do. That's why the North Carolina General Assembly. Assembly has decided that those crimes had to be reported. That's not an option to report it. It's required by law. So the other thing I would share, I think, is that our conversation since then has been that I understand what happened. Um, and we've had a conversation, and I think that it would be handled a little bit differently in the future. I think it was very well intentioned as to what they were trying to determine as what had happened or not happened on the campus. And so we've had a conversation about that um, in terms of particularly if it involves any conversation of a firearm, and that would be handled a little bit differently in the future. Sure. When you notify Wake County Security? Wake County Security was notified on Tuesday afternoon. Why not here? You notified one, why not the other? You well, notified the one that you would get in trouble within the Wake County School System you notified, but the one that required you to notify them by law you did not notify. So I'm not disagreeing with you, sir. I mean, again, we've had conversations since then along the line, make sure that we're shoring you things up. You understand how that does not instill I, I understand. safety in my mind. I mean, I agree that it's great that my child's got a cell phone and all this happens, but I've got to feel safe. And I got you to inform me what's going on so I can make a decision. And for you to inform me at 5 o'clock on a Friday on something that happened on Monday, that left a lot of us not very happy. I understand. And that's why. I sent you an email immediately, and I didn't hear back from you until Monday. That's why the, the following and week. I sent a chief email. It went to been Monday before I heard back from you. Maka, and then we'll go to the back. May have, may have bumped off. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I want to say thank you so much for having this forum. I really, really appreciate it. I know that you really have a hard job. Um, and I 
And as a parent, I'm frightened personally, but I do appreciate the work that you do. The question I have um, is, as you, as you guys are educating us, I know that y'all do the drills, um, so what's the conversation with students? Because um, I think that each time something happens, I'm just wondering, is, are students, do they have an opportunity to kind of um, debrief and kind of talk about these issues and talk about what to do and for you guys to kind of educate them in terms of not passing Snapchat. So I'm just kind of wondering, you're educating the parents, so how, what's the school doing to educate students in a near way? Well, we had a, um, we had a meeting with all staff uh, to discuss, about, discuss this issue um, and, and to have those conversations with their students in the classroom. Now, some teachers feel more comfortable having those conversations than others, which is kind of, again, come from this and, and talking with just what you are saying right here is that what, what kind of forum do we create with our students who are not, because I know some students did have the conversation, and some students did have conversations with their teachers, and, and they felt pretty equipped in order to have those. Some students never had that conversation, so they're left out. And we need to make sure that we are creating some kind of venue uh, in a meaningful way, so it's not 2,800 kids coming together and you're trying to have a conversation with them, um, that those students, that, that that you're visiting them in a smaller group so they feel a little more comfortable having those conversations. So we're trying to work through that and make that determination. I'm not saying that we finalized that at all, but it's something that we are working on because we realize the students have a voice and have a concern and, and, and want to know as well. At least just to be able to ask questions. I don't feel like anywhere near 100% at this point. 
Well, with, with the doors, and I thank you for that question. Uh, the doors do have the panic doors that, that push out, but they are locked on the end. I mean, my concern is always they, they are locked after we have students in the building. Yeah, but the thing is, is they're not locked in the mornings when they, they are full. I see, kid, I see you know, kids going in these entrances you know, where there's nobody, and they just walk right in. Well, we do have teachers inside. No, so, they're not. I mean, what I look, they're not, they're, there's not anybody. Inside. All right, then I'll talk to Mr. Pruitt about that, because we have talked, and I don't know if you were the one that made the comment about, you know, that we... It was about three weeks ago we opened it up in order to speed up carpool, and then, then Parkland happened, and then we started having some, maybe those doors should be locked back up. And we've had conversation with our administration and make sure that we are locking those doors back up. I don't think it's taken effect at this point, but it, it needs to pretty immediately and get that message back out. Uh, but we are also supposed to, teachers are supposed to be inside on the stairwells, um, inside, the, you know, they aren't right at that door but they're inside with those stairwells. But if they're not monitoring, that's obviously another reason why they have those doors uh, kept locked in the morning. Um, it still doesn't stop the, you know, we have the back area for the, when the buses come in and then the, then the front door entrance. Um, Are those monitors where the, where the bus students come in? And where? Yeah, well, we have, we have um, administration out in the bus loop in that area. And then we have um, the SRO and myself are in the cafeteria area watching those entrances. And we have a teacher by each entrance as well of the three areas in the morning that in, in the main area, because most students come to the cafeteria area. After that first bell, the custodians come through and lock all doors. Really the only entrance that is to be unlocked during, during the day is that one front entrance that they have to come into that vestibule area. And the only way that they can get into the rest of the school is through the, uh, through the main office. That's the only way you can get through because those other doors, again, the, the panic's on the inside, so you can't go through those doors. Um, we do have the keyless entry in about four or five that if I hit this, it'll unlock the door for me. And that includes the main office when it's not, when it's locked, you can't get in there unless you have, have this badge. Um, <sighs> There are three or four that are keyless entry. So if a teacher decides to take, uh, like one of our science teachers decides to take the group out, they have to go through a specific door if they're doing a lab or something outside. And the way they, they can't get back into the building unless they, they key in. Now I know at Garner uh, High School when we return, there's, there's multiples. I believe it's almost every building has the, this entrance to the building. Um, where this one, I believe it's about five entrances around the school have that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you guys for very much for putting this forum together. My question is around students that are being bused into the school. How involved are the school bus drivers in these discussions? And are they ba basically being informed? Should a student come on the bus? I'm sorry if you can't hear me. Uh, if, this, if a student were to come on the bus, are they also involved in these conversations? Because as we know, there are a number of students that are bused in here. Mm -hmm. So as we're doing all of these things in this beautiful school, someone could put a gun in their backpack on the bus. Now we've not seen that yet, but I would rather for us to be prepared for something like that because that could be the next wave to what we're seeing happening in schools and universities. It could be a student saying, I'm not going to be stupid enough to go to the campus and shoot up the campus, but I can get 12 to 15 students on the school bus. So are our school bus drivers a part of this discussion as to what they need to do if a student comes on the bus and looks a little out of place or a student on the bus happens to say that there's a weapon on the bus? What are the protocols? Because my son is one that is bused in. Right. So I'm very, very concerned, not only with what may be happening in the school, but also his safety on the school bus. Thank you for that question. Um, I think there's a larger context that's ended up being a Wake County question. And I know that Wake County is having those discussions as you heard the message from um, our board chairman, uh, was it about a week or so ago? They are coming together and having those com conversations. And I know part of that is dealing with the school buses because they know that there's a concern there with that. Now, I would assume they're bringing in transportation 
and then determining what they're going to do with training as far as with the school bus drivers. Well, I would le definitely like that to be an agenda item because as I said, as a parent who has a son who's being bussed in every day, granted he's a senior and some may say, well, my son won't have to worry about this yep. after this school year, but I'm concerned about the safety of all of our students right. because we all know that there's tons of students that are coming here on buses. And if they don't have that on the radar, I would like for that to be on the radar because that definitely could be the next wave. And right. I don't want Wake County Schools to be the first school to have a situation with the bus right. and guns. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, thank you all very, very much. Uh, I echo everybody's sentiments that I'm very grateful for this discussion. And um, I had uh, emailed you, Principal Carter, before about right after the incident at Parkland happened. And I had asked you about, you know, what are, what does, what does the, the door situation look like? And you had let me know that um, something like metal de detectors, that's a Wake County school um, sort of issue. So I, I have a couple of questions, but the first is uh, may, to the mayor, is there something that Garner could do at a, as a city to provide more security for our students on campus? Like well, I mean, the press has already mentioned the fact a lot of what he has to deal with is under the parameters of the school system. We work with the school system. If they ask us, we'll cooperate with them. Okay, so, so what are their problems? I, 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 the school working and purchase that they can parents if there was a fund for that account? Yeah, that's kind of along the lines. Could you repeat your question? I'm sorry. So like if, the, if the parents were to get together and have enough. Yeah, it's not working. Yeah, if the parents were to get together and raise enough money to purchase metal detectors for Well, from a law enforcement side, I mean, from, from the school system side, I think that's a question for the Board of Education, unfortunately. Um, the, the struggle that comes with metal detectors is metal detectors are great, but then you've got to staff the metal detectors, and you also need to be careful that you don't impose a false sense of security. Um, because, again, we can put students through metal detectors, but you've got to have somebody there to run the metal detector, and then you've got to figure out how many metal detectors you're going to purchase to put 20, however many hundred students on this campus in, in a relatively narrow window in the morning. I'm not saying we can't, but I'm saying there's a lot of logistics to that, and it's not just the cost of the metal detectors, it's the ongoing cost of the staff to run the metal detectors. But again, that's, that's primarily a Wake County school system question. I totally get that. I mean, you know, there's not a false sense of security when I board a plane because I'm going for metal detector. I mean, but there is an added level that we don't have right yes. now. Right? Yes. So I get the I get the logistics of it, but I guess I'm looking like, okay, it, it might be hard, but what can we do? I mean, I, I feel like it's like there's gotta be something more that we can do. And I know we can't, you know, saran wrap the school. I well, I, I think there are other answers. Um, I think the short term answer is vigilance. I think is is keeping eyes open and being intelligent about what we're watching and what we're doing. And that's the other piece that I would offer, and I'm not going to put her necessarily on the spot, but Representative Gill has come in, and she's serving on the Legislative Committee on School Safety. Um, so we've had a conversation about that, and I know she's here to listen. I think I can say that for her, um, that she's here to listen and hear these things. So that's what will, you're not only addressing this, I think, to the Wake County Public School System, but you're addressing it to your legislators that are meeting on this very issue, not literally as we speak, but in the time frame that we're talking about here, to see what can be done and to see where do the funds come from because unfortunately, and, th and that's not a great answer, don't get me wrong, but a lot of the easy answers involve money. And then we've got to figure out where does that money come from, um, you know, whether it's the school system, the state, or whoever else. Do you have a second question, yes, ma'am, and then we'll come back there. I, I, just very quick. Um, I wanted to echo what um, this lady over here said about, I think it would be very, very beneficial if 
uh, a few as a school administration actually had a school-wide conversation with all the kids mm -hmm. and just get everything out there and say, this is what happened, you saw it on the news, you know, what do you think, what can we do? I, I feel that's, I mean, that's a, a, not a no-brainer. So that, that would be the first thing. Second thing, um, Officer Gorman, you said have a conversation with your kids and um, tell them to, if they have to, fight for their life. What does that look like? If I'm going to have that conversation with my child, what does fight for your life you know, mean? And um, my last question is, what do you want us to ask them to report? So I have gone through my son's social media, and some um, families have guns in their homes, they have rifles, they have, and their son and their children take pictures with the, you know, I find that very disturbing. Do I, do I call and say one of the kids that my son follows on Instagram is posing with a gun? He hasn't made any threats. I mean, what, it, like, how far do we go with this? So let me answer the last one, then I'll turn it back to Officer Gorman. And if you didn't hear, the question was, if on social media, a lot of times you may see other families that may be more prevalent with firearms or may be more comfortable with firearms. You may see families or individuals with pictures, Snapchats, Instagrams, whatevers um, with firearms and should you report everything. And I think you have to put some of that in context. Um, you have to look at what is going on in the circumstance. Is there language with it? Is there a threat with it? Is there anything else with it? But when it's all said and done, if you're uncomfortable with it, report it. Um, again, the worst thing that can happen is we can have too many reports that turn into nothing was wrong. Um, we'd much rather have that than not have the report of something that is going to become an issue. And then the other question uh, was directed to Officer Gorman following up on what does it mean or what does it look like to fight for your life, particularly as a student. So I think in the context of that, what we were talking about at that point was the, the run, hide, or fight. And I think obviously... <coughs> Our first two objectives for any of these situations where, where that is going to be a response is hopefully you've got the ability to run high. But if it does get to the point where it, it goes to bad and your child is in a point where they have to fight for their life, it's a, a kind of common sense dictates that hopefully they don't ever get to that point. But if it is the choice of kill or be killed, if you will, then they need to, to put every ounce of their effort into to making sure that they walk out of that situation alive. And unfortunately, with all these things and all these different things that we come up with, you know, like this young lady came up with the, the idea that there could be a, an incident that happens on a bus. Uh, Parkland, it was somebody pulled a fire alarm and, you know, kids were out in the hallways and they were, they were easy victims. We can't really account for what situations are, are going to come up. It's, it's always going to be a, a dynamic situation. And that's kind of why I was, I was emphasizing that maybe if you can, just sit down and go over some basics with your kids and what you would expect them to do in, in these given situations. That if they face an, an active shooter situation, maybe what you want them to do is, if possible, hide. But if a situation presents itself where they would be better off in their judgment to hop out a window and run, then maybe that's the conversation you need to have with your kid. But it's kind of a, a something that, that you need to discuss with your kid, that you need to sit down with the family. And unfortunately, like the mayor said, this is something that none of us ever hoped or, or wanted to, to have to look at, but unfortunately we're here now. And so I think it all needs to start at home with sit down, talk to your kid, and let them know that if something like this happens, I expect you to run across the street and hide in the woods or hide in the closet in the, the classroom, whatever. I, I think that's a, a conversation that you guys need to have at home. It's a very personal conversation. Is that kind so, of cool with what you were, you were asking about? We're unfortunately running out of time because there's an event that needs to occur here at 7.30. So we're going to take a couple more questions, and then I, we, we will be out back um, and happy to answer more questions as we wrap up. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, uh, so my church uh, asked a question of their insurance company about bearing arms, and uh, they were referred uh, to, uh, to a local law enforcement. We're able to get local law enforcement to come in and evaluate our church's security. Um, and, I'm, and, you know, and I'm just wondering, do we provide that sort of thing to make sure that our school is, has some basic security um, you know, processes, doors are locked? And I mean, he just came, you know, when we were having a worship service and he checked the door and he was looking to see whether or not people were in place, you know, to, to, to 
look at visitors and so forth when they came in. And, and I'm just saying, is that something you can provide for the school? We, we do that. We do that through the school resource officer program. Um, we do that. Um, the young lady standing in the back is Sergeant Sophia Sandlin. She is the sergeant over our SRO program. She is on campus as her schedule allows, and sometimes that's particularly to talk to someone, but sometimes that's just to walk around and to see what's going on and to do things like that. And then the other component of that is the Wake County Public School System security staff and they are on campus to do that as well. You heard them talk about threat assessments, and you heard them talk about testing on the crisis plan and things like that, so that is being done. Yes, ma'am. Um, first, I just want to say thank you to the people who have been working on this plan. Um, one question is for the principal. Um, I want to know what routine did you have in place so that you can get to know as many of the students at the school as possible? Because I can tell you, as for my daughter, and they know your voice, they know your name because of the messages. They do not know your face, they do not know who you are. Um, I know with your other principals at elementary and at middle school that those principals would come into the class and to actually show their presence and say, hey, I am the male role model in this class and I am the principal. But these kids don't know you and I understand that there are a ton of kids here and you can't get to all of them. But I don't think that you're doing everything that you could. My daughter says that you can walk by some of these classes and that black piece of paper that you're supposed to have covering the windows, she says that it's torn so that any gun can look right in there and see what's going on. Have you checked that to make sure that they are protected? And my last question to you, you tell us what we need to do as for uh, protecting these kids and as we're talking to them. But when there was an emergency issue and I reached out to you about my child where she had had her second brain surgery and you all put her on a seven foot pyramid and have her drop to the I reached out to you and I said, hey, I said, I need help. I said, I need to talk to somebody about this issue. Your staff told me, as if you were the wizard behind the green curtain, that I did not have access to you in reference to that. I could not have a conference with you. I, the only conference I could have was a phone conference to ask why nothing was done about this for my child. So you're not, for you to sit here and say that we should go to someone, the kids can't even go to you. If I can't go to you, how are the kids supposed to go to you? And that's what I, what I feel like you need to know. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm going to ask the chief to do something. You asked about the town's involvement. Will you run through quickly what an SRO cost to put him or her in the school to cost? Yes, sir. So um, right now, the, the question the mayor asked me to address is the cost of the SRO. So each year, or I should say back in probably 1998 or 99, when the school uh, SRO program started, uh, the state of North Carolina set a standard that each high school uh, would be provided basically pass-through funding in the amount of about $38,700 to go towards a police officer to be in school. And in 98-99, uh, that was a reasonable amount to fund salary and benefits, probably not all the stuff that comes with it, but to at least put a police officer in place in the high school. Uh, in 2018, we get the same $38,700 and some dollars from uh, the Wake County School System as path through from the state of North Carolina towards our SRO, towards Officer Gorman's salary. Um, and then in this unique case at the high school, the second officer comes from an agreement between the town and uh, a former principal that they would forego a security officer and contribute $20,000 towards the second SRO. And then we get, I believe, a combined $9,400 towards the two middle school SROs. Um, so all told, the town of Garner is investing between $250,000 and $300,000 a year to ensure that there are uniformed police officers in these schools. Um, and that number will potentially, should the council decide so to not, add, not grow no as the new high school opens as well. So with that, again, I apologize we didn't get to all the questions, but I know I can speak for at least three of us um, that will be uh, out back and happy to answer some more, but they have an event that's going to come yeah. on to the stage in here. Um, so we'll be coming outside and be happy to answer uh, individual questions as, as long as you'd like to have them. And thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.